It's very easy to describe an ugly world that should make you feel helpless and insecure about the future. An uncertain future is the key to selling people things that they don't need. It's all just cynical marketing that tells you that every moment you wait is a moment you wasted. That every moment you don't act, you remain a slave to your wages, your circumstance, and all these things that you can magically change so long as you buy this thing that I happen to be selling. With many of us stuck at home during the height of the pandemic, regular social interaction became sparse. All you had was FaceTime, phone calls, and video games to get any modicum of social interaction. Twitch streams surged in viewership, Among Us became the most popular game, Fall Guys was popping off and people were finding anything and everything that would give them something to do with their inner circle. Gaming exploded during the pandemic, but it wasn't alone in its meteoric rise. The allure of the future of internet and finance became inescapable. NFTs, Web3, Crypto, just some of the recurring characters that you'd hear about from friends and family about what was very obviously a bubble just waiting to burst. While I think those concepts are genuinely snake oil pitches, let's focus on one particularly ambitious beast that is a particularly efficient means of burning tons of money. The promise of the metaverse. It's tiring to constantly hear buzzwords like innovation, disruption, game-changing, groundbreaking, and all these other terms attributed to concepts and projects that aren't going to amount to anything worthwhile. It's marketing speech, selling you stuff that you don't need to make you feel like you'll miss out. But don't worry, surely metaverses won't go the way of internet-enabled kitchen appliances, right? The term metaverse originated in Neil Stevenson's cyberpunk novel Snow Crash. The phrase is a portmanteau of the words meta and universe. The world is in disarray, global economies have collapsed, and people use the metaverse to turn away from the ugliness of reality. Snow Crash's metaverse is a virtual world that you access using headgear or public terminals. Inside the metaverse, people can interact with a virtual world and use custom avatars to express themselves. But if you use public access terminals instead of high-end tech to access the metaverse, you look like a low-resolution sprite compared to other people's very detailed and sophisticated 3D models. This creates a hierarchy of metaverse users that are differentiated through the complexity of their avatars in relation to everyone else. The plot revolves around thwarting a virus that spreads throughout the metaverse that would give its users brain damage in real life. I feel like looking at cyberpunk stories for inspiration for modern technology is both ironic and hilarious. Surely a tale about eroding human rights and freedoms because of unregulated megacorps owning every aspect of life is a good baseline to draw my next big tech idea from, right? Oh man. The generalized goal of metaverses is to enable people to connect globally, express themselves in ways they cannot in the real world, as well as taking aspects of everyday life online. Connecting people is the beginning point, but its endgame is actually to merge socialization, playing, commerce, and work into one place. Each metaverse prioritizes these goals to varying degrees, and as a result have fundamentally different structures from one another. I think metaverses are missing the mark, because they're built upon a lot of assumptions about why people play games and socialize online. But I want to share my thoughts on why I play games, and how connecting with others through gaming has affected me. I think understanding connection is essential to underpinning why I think every metaverse is destined to die. When I was younger, I used to go to the arcade alone. And before you feel sorry for me, I did have friends, but they weren't the type that liked going out and hanging out in public super often. I was in the gifted kid class, as embarrassing as that is to say out loud. I looked up to my brother a lot as a kid, and he went out all the time, so I idolized him as kind of the picture of a cool older brother. I'd ask my mom for some money, and I'd go to the arcade wasting a few hours there playing some games. Wangam Midnight Maximum Tune, Time Crisis, and Initial D were in rotation for me starting out. The arcade was a noisy place, with overlapping sounds, music blasting in every direction, and more racing games than I could count on one hand. One day, I got the courage to play Dance Dance Revolution after watching someone else play with their friend. I was so inspired by the intricate sh movement on display that I thought to myself, I can do that if I really try and learn how. I started going there every Friday, playing DDR. I was alone most of the time, but I wasn't really sad to be alone. I was having fun. I loved playing it, and I loved the rhythm of my feet stomping down on the metal while I was learning something new. In case you're curious, my usual set list was Morning Glory by B4U, A by DJ Amaro, followed by Max 300. One day, the person that inspired me to start playing asked me for money to take the bus. 
and I obliged. I didn't mind, it was just pocket change to me after all, and I saved up that money for nothing but arcade games anyway. And I figured getting home safe was far more important than just playing another set on DDR. The following week, I met some people while waiting to play Wangan Midnight Maximum 2 in 3DX. One of those people would become my best friend during my teen years, and in turn I met a lot of people that I wouldn't have met otherwise. Funnily enough, these two people actually knew each other and went to the same school together. Two years later, I transferred school to be with my arcade friends. I left behind my current life at my current school, and I wanted to move closer towards my friends that I wanted to hang out with every day. I hung out with them during lunch times, and when I got home we'd play games like League of Legends together. Transferring didn't come at some big cost to me. I immediately got put in the advanced class again, and I was happy to be around all of my close friends. In retrospect, I am kind of surprised my parents just let me transfer schools, but they were cool for that. It was through these incidental connections and memories that I formed so many meaningful bonds with others. It's these random yet meaningful connections that metaverses have to be able to match. The key element isn't that it happened in real life, it's that there was a medium to engage with others and form those bonds to form real and lasting connections. When I thought about these memories, I learned what's essential to building a successful virtual world. At a very baseline level, you need context, socialization, and expression. Context is just a shared activity that you can do in some localized space. For a younger me, that was the arcade with my friends from that time. Today, that would probably be any game that has multiplayer in it. Socialization is the ability to interact with the community, not just people in your own group. Such a broad definition probably makes just about any multiplayer game qualify, but that's a deliberate choice by me. Expression is the ability to customize your appearance in some way, or use things like emotes to convey some kind of mood, feeling, thought, or idea, often in a manner that is difficult to do in real life. Context, socialization, expression. It's so damn simple in my eyes because it elucidates the truth of seeking a metaverse. We already have games that can be qualified as metaverses, so if metaverses don't even match their ability to connect people together, why should they exist? Picture this, you have a social media giant that used to wear the crown. You cannibalize every single piece of social media that poses a threat to your platforms including Instagram in 2012 and WhatsApp in 2014. Surely with lofty purchases like these, Meta would have a monopoly in social media, right? Wrong. Facebook is largely seen as the app for old people, and TikTok is bodying it among younger demographics. And everyone else? They use Twitter, though that might be on a limited timeline given how that site is going lately. Apple's changes to iOS tracking and privacy did a significant number on the company's ability to generate revenue. This occurred in conjunction with stagnant user growth due to Facebook literally reaching the population ceiling of potential users. Facebook can't grow its user base, it can only expand its service lines. Cue the shift from Facebook to Meta, a metaverse first company. One of the only attempts at innovation I've seen from Facebook in just about 16 years of being a casual user. I genuinely don't know what they've done with the site other than allow fake news to spread through poor moderation and hit the newsfeed with a new coat of paint every few years. Horizon Worlds is touted as the platform that will gradually become the virtual world which integrates work and play. Currently, it only supports the Oculus ecosystem, so if you've got a Valve Index or a HTC Vive or any other manufacturer, you're out of luck. If you're wondering how things are going, this platform is so unappealing and soulless that Meta employees have to be encouraged to use the Metaverse regularly, which spells out one thing to consumers and investors. That shit is worthless. So worthless, in fact, that despite their attempts to drum up hype for it and the limited release in test markets, nobody's playing it. You've just invented a virtual sandbox with ads. And even funnier than that, you can't prevent Facebook from tracking different data about your VR usage in their headsets. It's so bad, in fact, that they can use information about how you've used Horizon Worlds to influence the personalized ads you see to give you a better experience with advertising. Yeah, okay, sure. Additionally, Oculus headsets store your physical data, not just your usage analytics, so Mark knows that you're actually 5'10 and not 6 foot like you claim on social media. When you weigh up your options, it's highly unlikely that the average person would choose Horizon Worlds over any of its contemporaries. So much that people are more fascinated to hear about how Meta's value has diminished in the years since it became Meta than hearing about any positive developments from the platform. 
Zuckerberg has spearheaded a project that fails to generate any interest in a new and innovative virtual world. Since it's one that comes with all these added downsides like advertising, data tracking, and most importantly, a lack of real and meaningful purpose other than watching a concert or playing mediocre mini games. You're doing everything that games like VRChat, Roblox, Fortnite, Gary's Mod, and Second Life have been doing for years now, and you're doing it worse. Creating shared context in Horizon Worlds entails making a custom world or experiencing one of the collabs that are handcrafted by Meta, or engaging in one of the minigames available to you. In theory, this should drive people to talk to one another, but it doesn't have half the heart and soul of any other virtual world available to you. Just look at this ad. You see a broken world that's left behind and people turn to the metaverse for fun, which is literally the future that Snow Crash warned us about to begin with. To be frank, I know much more people that play random games on Roblox, play creative on Fortnite, and hang out with strangers in VR chat than I do people that are interested in Horizon Worlds. This is because all my friends are gamers, and when something is janky and awful, they don't go, oh, it's a good baseline. They just call it dog shit and uninstall it. Because there's no point in subjecting yourself to a half-baked product that you're essentially beta testing, even though Meta has staked so much of its money on the metaverse blowing up. There is no killer app for the Oculus ecosystem, and Horizon Worlds is not going to change that perception. Especially with the lack of meaningful context to interact with people unless you count going to a Post Malone concert and talking to his fans or something. When it comes to socialization, I think that Horizon Worlds has no clear identity or edge that makes it interesting. A VR shared space where you can talk with others and make friends? VR chat already exists, and I can walk around as Testament from Guilty Gear while talking about why Goku is stronger than Superman with some strangers. Sure, I can talk to random people in Horizon Worlds, but it's more difficult than just going to Diluc's Tavern and talking to people about gacha games or something. You can't really search and filter for people in the same way that you can in other virtual worlds. There's no place that you can just go and chill with people who like Toho, or RP worlds where you can engage in impromptu roleplaying. It's this lack of flexibility and freedom that really hinders the social aspect of new metaverses, and it's an absolute shame to say that considering that Second Life, which is two decades old, has more in the way of curating your social experiences than Horizon Worlds, which is made by one of the most powerful tech companies in the world. By contrast, video games treat socialization very differently. I feel that most games develop a solid gameplay core before building their social systems around that, implementing features like voice chat, guilds, and group chats, which allows people to network with one another, they continue playing together. Most modern multiplayer games do facilitate the development of social connections. I feel that the social aspect of most games is often something that complements the main offering, but it's rarely ever the primary feature. Granted, great games do tend to have ways to socialize like you see in Fortnite, which features event spaces, creative custom maps, and the ability to make some licensed character do a silly little dance with your friends. The shared experience of playing an enjoyable game with someone else is something that can really draw people together. If you stacked all your eggs in the social options but the game itself sucked, sure, it would probably still have a community that's non-zero, but it would have less appeal, and less appeal means less potential random encounters with people that might actually mean something to you one day. Interacting with people that you might befriend is honestly a very complex calculus of your personal habits as well as the volume of players on that game. If 25% of all players go out of their way to engage with randoms on a game, when you increase the size of the active player base, the quantity of people making seemingly random yet meaningful connections increases proportionately, at least in theory. If a game encourages people to go out of their way to disengage from the main gameplay loop and socialize with others, maybe that percentage goes up even further. You aren't really going to have that happen on Horizon Worlds because it doesn't generate any hype. And entire sections of the VR community aren't even allowed to download and play it because Meta wants a monopoly on the metaverse, so you need an Oculus headset to access it. If you make a VR metaverse, why would you want to section people off who might actually be interested in engaging with it? This is honestly a broader issue with the Oculus ecosystem, but you aren't putting out killer apps to make people stop going to competitors, so you might want to rethink the strat on that one, because the numbers aren't backing it up. Expression is the final key that metaverses really need in order to foster connection between its users. When I was going to the arcade, I could obviously show my facial expression, dress myself, pick what games I wanted to play, and talk to whoever I wanted to. It's because I could express myself in the way that I wanted that I felt comfortable talking to strangers. 
In Horizon Worlds, there is customization, and yes, there are ways to express yourself and engage with the world, but it's not enough to stand out against more comprehensive virtual worlds like VRChat. In VRChat, I can choose if I want to be Kai from Guilty Gear or a Kamen Rider and change between these two appearances within like 5 seconds of each other. In Horizon Worlds, I can despair at how out of touch Meta's sad little theme park is while my friends laugh at me for using Horizon Worlds. I just don't understand the hype. I don't think there's anything that draws people to Horizon Worlds because of how hard it failed to find a footing. Once word got out that Horizon Worlds only has about 200,000 active users, did Meta focus on addressing concerns and developing more tools and experiences that would actually foster meaningful connections between people? No. They laid off 11,000 employees of 30,000 that they hired and they plan to reduce hiring in 2023. Zuckerberg stated that this was the result of a lower growth in e-commerce and work shifting online combined with more competition <coughs> TikTok, in conjunction with rough macroeconomic conditions. Why would you settle for Zuckerberg's depressingly sad metaverse that was crunched out by workers that likely don't even work at Facebook anymore? In the push to become a metaverse first company, Facebook hired like 30,000 employees. How many of those 11,000 employees that got axed were crucial to the expansion plans for the company? The platform is so awful that employees refuse to play it. Nobody is enthusiastic about a poorly managed product with design goals that don't align with creating fun and meaningful experiences for users. 200,000 monthly active users might be great, but I've yet to see any metrics regarding things like average playtime and daily concurrent user peaks, which would give a clearer idea of the health of the platform. If you own a Quest 2, you might get curious and give the game a spin for like 5 minutes because it's free. But if we understood how those 200,000 users were interacting with the platform, we might be able to see whether the average Oculus user is deriving any utility from it at all. I'd argue that gamers are a significant demographic for Meta to win over if they want Horizon Worlds to succeed. But there's one problem with that. Gamers are pretty keen at spotting a game that's headed down a death spiral. It's baffling to think that you'll survive mediocrity when consumers literally have better options available to them. They might spend 10 minutes looking and seeing what handcrafted experience have been made by Meta, then peruse the custom worlds that users have made for about 30 minutes and think, hmm, maybe I'll just go goof off as a Genshin character in VRChat instead, and talk with people I know share common interests with myself. The question I find myself asking is, how free am I really in that metaverse? If I can't look cool as shit and I'm boxed into this really boring and ugly art style that Meta's prescribed me, why would I stay? Why would I spend money or time in a world that doesn't even want the majority of VR users in it? If I must give up so much to be part of Horizon Worlds Metaverse, the product in question should have something to show. But instead, all we've seen is Mark firing thousands of employees on a bet that might have some software engineers getting grey hairs because they're not employed in times of economic turmoil. Even if the company eventually makes the platform good, consumers should never forget the human cost of making this metaverse, and how those workers never reap the benefits of its eventual success. I apologize if I sound cynical about Meta, but the company's lost over $700 billion in value in the last year. A number that sounds like monopoly money because it functionally could have been used for literally anything else of value for the world. But instead it was lost on making an escapist fantasy that you have to pay to be part of. And if your friends don't own an Oculus headset, they're out of luck. 11,000 jobs, $700 billion, and a whole lot of wasted time. Horizon Worlds is just a big promise that could never have been kept. I don't blame the workers. I blame senior management on this project and Zuckerberg's unrealistic vision born from an ego that's flown far too close to the sun. Call it ad hominem or whatever, but this dude is possibly the biggest idiot running one of the biggest companies on the planet. We don't have to hand anything to such an incompetent leader that's failed his own workforce and its users. The irony of what I'm about to say is not lost on me, so let's get a little meta with this last section. The conception of a metaverse in a contemporary sense is trying to repackage ideas and gameplay that's already implemented in other games prior to the mainstreaming of the term metaverse. Many games already act as metaverses, but they don't describe themselves as such because it's meaningless to box themselves into that. There's no benefit to doing it, and retroactively adjusting games like Roblox and Second Lives to be metaverses is just stupid. Sure, companies are allowed to do it, but the term doesn't give rise to anything of substance. 
Second Life released in 2002, and that game lets people do freeform things with their expressions, socialization, and context, with world building tools and a lot of user generated content. User generated content is basically the lifeblood of SL, and while I don't really care for playing it myself, it's undeniable that it's influenced the way that we think about gaming today. Gary's Mod released in 2006, allowing people to import models, create custom maps and modes all within Source Engine. Back in the day, people would make animations using Gary's Mod, and today you have classics like TTT, Murder and Cinema Worlds, which demonstrates how a game can act as both a social space and a game. Minecraft Classic released in 2009, with its full release being in 2011. This game needs no introduction. It's been home to some of the most extensive modding and scripting people have ever seen in a game besides Skyrim. To this day, this game is a gaming giant that isn't going anywhere because it has infinite possibilities for creativity and expression and honestly, it's kind of nice to see that because I played a lot when I was a kid. VRChat released in 2014 and admittedly my experience with VRChat is quite recent because I've only just got into VR myself, but the time that I've spent on it has shown me the boundless creativity of its users, the potential to design interesting and intriguing worlds that ultimately just make people feel more comfortable talking with others, especially if they're a little too shy to do it in the real world. You can look like a character from any game or anime you want and you can peruse so many interesting worlds with similar minded people even if you end up just bumming around the same joints looking for new people to talk to. To me, that's kind of a beautiful thing, and I know it's corny to describe the game in such an idealized way, especially when you might just hear a 13 year old yell slurs at you, but I've had a lot of fun talking to random people on there despite the chaos that comes with public lobbies. VRChat is probably one of the best virtual world experiences you can have, and I didn't feel like the game was reaching for my wallet when I was playing it. Every game I just described could serve the same functions as Horizon Worlds, so why does Horizon Worlds even exist? They thrive because they weren't born out of a desire to chase investment from speculators who are intrigued by terms like Web3, the metaverse, and they're building solid platforms for people to enjoy their time gaming. Invariably, all of these games have had their issues past and present, but in terms of offering, what's there is much more substantial than meta has at the moment. I don't think that games should chase every trend. I think sometimes games are simply more enjoyable when they're made to be solid experiences first and foremost. And if you can share those experiences with others, then that's the perfect context for socialization and expression. It really can't get any easier than that. When something finds its footing, sometimes it's because it has a wide reaching and mainstream appeal. But for a lot of games, it's really niche communities contained within the larger gaming community that make those things thrive. At the arcade, rhythm gamers are kind of niche. They're a small yet tight-knit community. Rhythm gamers are pretty nice in my experience. They'll ask you things like, do you want to play together? And offer advice if you ask for it. They can be pretty helpful. A rhythm gamer is just one niche of person at the arcade. They exist in the same space as people who play rail shooters like Time Crisis or racing games like Maxi Tune. They all have different interests in the arcade, but occupying that same space gives it life. In the same way, any play account for any game is constituted by so many different niches who enjoy the game for completely different reasons. My Metaverse is not even one that has any user-generated content. The game that bridges context, socialization, and expression for me is a little-known MMO called Final Fantasy XIV. There's raiders, roleplayers, casuals, and people who just want to go AFK outside Limsa. I won't bore you to death with too many technical details because I don't really care if you end up playing it or not, but I started the game about 8 years ago after asking a friend if the game was any good. They said yeah it is, and I bought it on a whim. And I met friends that I've been close with to this day. The bonds I forged on that game were so strong that I even flew across the ocean to the United States to hang out with a bunch of them at a convention together. It's really nerdy to say, and it was really expensive to do, but having forged those friendships in the furnaces of 14 really did act as a lifeboat to me. I met people that I would have otherwise had no chance interacting with, and to this day, I've spent so much time getting people into the game and its great story and gameplay that I don't regret my time with it. It's not as free an expression as something like VRChat, but its emotes, communities, and the very basic guild feature have given me so many good things to cherish about the game, as well as things I cherish in person. It even connected me to a friend that's no longer with us, but we still mourn his passing every year, not just because we played the game together, but because the game allowed us to connect with and learn about someone who was a genuinely beautiful human being that's no longer with us. I remember raiding with him back in the day, and one day he was super late to raid because he was barbecuing stuff on the grill. 
and I couldn't stop laughing about how he was live blogging it all while we were supposed to be putting prog hours in on a boss we were up to. It's things like this through these random and easy to miss connections that speak volumes to you about how lucky you can be to even meet the people you know in your life. And that makes me feel so grateful. Even if I play the game in a very particular way, I know that there's millions of people other than myself enjoying the game their own way, making their own memories and shaping that journey into their own, while experiencing that all with other people. I care not if my audience is at all interested in the game, it's just my outlet and the game that was important to me. I know that for a lot of people watching, they probably have something they feel similarly about, maybe it's RuneScape or something. I know that everyone out there probably has that niche interest or game that's connected them to people that they probably would have passed by and never met in life. For me, I'm thankful that I took the time to give a game a chance that was previously known for being complete dog shit. Because of that, I got to know so many wonderful people. Why bother buying an Oculus headset and investing your time into a meaningless virtual world that's just sad and lonely? The majority of online gaming experiences that you can have today serve as a far better launchpad than any snake oil a company can conceive of. It doesn't have to be a metaverse, it just has to be good enough to hold your attention. And surely, in time, you might meet someone that means a lot to you just as I and many others have. Metaverses be damned, connecting is the important part. Why do we have to be part of Mark's sad little VR land to do it? If you can find a place where you feel most comfortable expressing yourself, talking with others, and doing all that within a shared context, then you already have all that you need to find your arcade, to change your life, and meet some cool people in doing so. There's no surefire way to meet new people that'll become significant in your life. That kind of thing is kind of random. But with the gaming experiences available to us today, I feel like it's a lot easier than when I was in high school grinding away learning DDR at the arcade, hoping to make new friends. I hope that everyone listening can have that kind of special experience of meeting someone random that changes their lives in a positive way. The metaverse is just playing catch up with multiplayer games that have been doing what they want to do better for a very long time now. It's kind of astounding that billions are being poured into developing platforms that house a low number of players. If these companies want to burn all their cash doing something that will take years to recover from, they can be my guest. Personally. I think that we should let them burn. Thank you for watching today's video guys. Like, subscribe and comment if you'd like me to read anything. Um, I'm a little bit sick right now, or sort of sick. I have like a kind of jaw condition happening right now and it's making it kind of hard to hear out of one of my ears. And my voice is also super hoarse because I got sick this week. But uh, I want you guys to take care of yourselves these holidays and thank you for sticking around. Um, I'm going to do a brief content update next week. And I'm going to talk about things I'm playing, things I'm reading, stuff like that. And my next video is probably going to be about Chainsaw Man. It's going to be a bit of an analysis piece. Anyway, I'm going to try and take a rest and recover from this ear thing that's making it hard to hear. But take care of yourselves. See ya.